1. Monday, June 10, 2019 The Ocean View Diner where I was waiting for my fried shrimp basket was a dump with a view of nothing but the courthouse parking lot. It was already shabby when I was in high school, living on fries and coffee while I brainstormed the college application essays that were my ticket out. Much to the surprise of folks in my hometown, I'd made it to law school and beyond. I owned more than a dozen suits. I had tan for summers in the office, navy for opening statements to the jury, charcoal for talking to the media on the Charleston courthouse steps. My kid had admired me at an age when it was almost unnatural to think your dad was anything but a loser. I was a law and order guy trying to make the world safer. I'd thought I'd run for office. I nodded to the bailiff who walked through the door, giving him a cordial howdy, but he looked right through me as he walked past. We'd certainly seen enough of each other in the courthouse, and I tried not to take offense at this slight, but there's only so much a man can put up with when it comes to small-town judgment. They say pride goeth before a fall. I'd seen enough in my past life representing the great state of South Carolina to know a man could have it a lot worse. The amount of depravity and human misery that flowed across my desk made me know that I ought to be grateful for what I still had left. My son, in other words, and my license to practice. I'd nearly lost both. The accident that took my wife had nearly killed him, too. And even if he still hadn't entirely recovered from it, he'd come farther than anyone expected at the time. But Noah was incredibly angry all the time. Mostly at me, but I tried not to let it get to me. Like water off a duck's back, the little things ought not to have bothered me at all. It shouldn't have mattered that the locals at the next table had stopped talking when I walked in, apparently suspicious of anyone who wasn't a regular, which I wasn't yet, since it had been barely six months since I dragged my sorry ass back from the big city. Getting to be a regular took years. A better man would not have been annoyed by the smell of rancid grease or the creak of ancient ceiling fans. It was even hotter in here than in the June glare outside, and a good man would have sympathized with my waitress, who was stuck here all day and probably never even got to sit down. But I was not that man. I did say thank you kindly when she dropped my order on the table and sloshed another dose of coffee in my cup, but I was irrationally annoyed that no one had ever fixed the menu sign on the wall between the cash register and the kitchen. The word cheeseburger was still missing its first R. When my friends and I were 16-year-old jackasses, we thought it was hilarious to order a cheeseburger. Now it was just pathetic that I was back. Especially since the reason I wasn't in the new 50s-style diner on the next corner, the popular lunch place for judges, local politicians, and successful attorneys, was that I couldn't afford it. Here, in exchange for tolerating the broken A.C. and worn-out furniture, I got decent shrimp at prices that were 15 or 20 years behind the times. The folks at the next table had gotten back to jawing, although at a lower volume on account of my being unfamiliar, I supposed. Between crunches of my dinner, I caught the gist. A body had washed ashore a little ways down the coast where tourists rented beach houses. Maybe I shouldn't have eavesdropped. But although I wasn't a prosecutor anymore, I was probably never going to lose the habit of keeping a close eye on every local crime. Bunch of them Yankees was playing volleyball on the beach, the man said. You know, girls in their bikinis, one of them thousand-dollar gas grills fired up on the deck. His voice held a mix of humor and scorn. They were having themselves just a perfect vacation. And then this corpse washes up. This, I swear to you, decomposing corpse crashes the party. The table erupted with guffaws. So what'd they do, a man said. Hop in the Subarus and hightail it back to New York or wherever? No, the thing is, and I heard this from my cousin, you know, the one working for the sheriff. The thing is, they thought a gator got him. Thought they had a gator in the water. And I'll be damned if they weren't pissing themselves like little girls trying to get everybody back out of the water. A couple of them was so scared they started puking. They all lost it. One of them was so entertained he slammed a hand on the table rattling the silverware. As the laughter started fading, one of them wondered aloud who the dead man might be. Ah, oh, don't matter none, the storyteller said. We ain't missing nobody. 
I felt a sourness in my gut. I couldn't go a day here without being reminded why I'd left. In Basking Raw, compassion for your fellow man was strictly circumscribed. Tourists got none. The wrong kind of people, whatever that meant, got none. Your family and lifelong friends could do no wrong, and everybody else could go straight to hell. I signaled the waitress and asked for a doggy bag. Might as well finish eating at home, away from present company. She scowled, probably thinking I was switching to takeout to avoid leaving a tip. I scrounged through my wallet, sure I'd had a few ones in there, and grudgingly set down a five, knowing I was leaving more than necessary. Making any kind of enemy was not my style. You never knew who might help you out one day if you'd taken care not to get on their bad side. More to the point, I knew from friends who worked in healthcare enforcement that there were few things stupider than making enemies of the folks who make your food. I'd parked my Chevy outside. It used to be the beater until the nice car was totaled in the accident. When I fired it up, the engine light came on again. I kept right on ignoring it. I'd yet to find a local mechanic I could trust. The one I knew of had been a bully back in high school, and from what I'd heard, age had only refined his techniques. If he thought you'd gotten too big for your britches, which I certainly had, what with my law degree and my former big city career, he took his rage out on your wallet. The Chevy, heroically, made it home once again. I parked beside the clump of fan palms that were starting to block the driveway. I needed to get them pruned and to fix the wobbly porch railing that would have been a lawsuit waiting to happen if we ever had visitors. I needed a haircut. My geriatric Yorkie squatter who limped to the door to greet me needed a trip to the vet. The to-do list never stopped growing, and checking anything off it required money I no longer had. I tossed the mail on the table and scratched the dog on the head. He'd come with the house, the landlord said he'd been abandoned by the previous tenants, and I couldn't bring myself to dump him at the pound. As he wagged his tail, I called out to my son. Noah? All I could hear was the breeze outside and squatters' nails scrabbling on the tile. I was no scientist, my major, long ago when I thought I was smart, was U.S. history, but I knew physics did not allow a house to be that quiet if it contained a teenage boy. It looked like I'd be eating another dinner alone. I'd texted Noah when I got to the diner to see if he wanted anything, but he hadn't answered. I never knew where he was lately, unless he was at a doctor's appointment I'd driven him to myself. After feeding squatter, I pulled up a chair, took a bite of now cold shrimp, and flipped through the mail. The monthly health insurance bill, nearly 1300 bucks just for the two of us, went into the small pile of things I couldn't get out of paying. Noah's physical therapy bills did, too. As long as he still needed PT, I couldn't risk getting blacklisted there. And he was going to need it for a good while yet, to have a shot at something like the life he'd been hoping for. We were both still hanging on to the thread of hope that he could get back into the shape that had earned him a baseball scholarship to USC and Columbia. The accident had cost him that, but he was determined to try again. Or so he'd said at first. Lately, he'd gotten depressed with how long it was taking and how much fun he saw his high school buddies having on Instagram. They'd gone to college and moved on with their lives. He'd started making new friends here, but to my dismay, they were not what you'd call college-bound. College didn't seem to have occurred to them. One worked in a fast food joint, and another didn't seem to work much at all. I heard gravel crunching in the driveway. Even without the odd rhythm his limp gave him, I knew it had to be Noah. Our little bungalow was an okay place to eat and sleep, but too small to be much of a gathering place. I stuffed the bills into my battered briefcase. He didn't need to know we were struggling. Squatter raced to the door to celebrate Noah's return and accompanied him back to the kitchen in a state of high canine excitement. Noah looked a little glum, or bored, as usual. Without bothering to say hi, he poured himself some tea from the fridge, sat down in the chair next to mine, and took one of my shrimp. I would have brought you some, I said. I texted you from the diner. He shrugged. I didn't see it in time, he said, feeding the crispy tail to squatter. That's a shame, I said. What were you so busy doing? He glared at me. That look was a one-two punch every time. He had his mother's eyes, so it felt like the hostility was coming from both of them. 
I knew I should back off, but I was never good at drawing the line in the right place. Hanging out with Jackson again? He took another shrimp, got up, and went into the living room. At 14, Noah had perfected the art of sullen teenager. Now at 19, he turned it into a lost art as he immersed himself in the depression and apathy that comes with having your life turned completely upside down. I was a big believer in surrounding yourself with people who had similar goals. Or at least not with people who'd just drag you down. Jackson wouldn't have been my first, second, or twelfth choice of friends for Noah. He was a troubled kid. Maybe it was time for me to admit that Noah was too, and not because of Jackson. We'd gone downhill as a family. It was as much my fault as anyone's, although most days I felt as though Noah blamed me for all of it. Many of those days I was sick and tired of being on the receiving end of my son's anger. For a man who'd made his living talking, I couldn't seem to make any headway with my son. In my head, I apologized to Elise. She'd been dead nearly a year, and I still talked to her, sometimes out loud. She would have wanted me to make peace with our son. So, I tried. Y'all have fun, at least? I hope it was a pretty good day. We hung out on his porch, he said, digging into the couch cushions for the TV remote. If that counts as fun. From his tone of voice, it didn't. He found the remote and turned the TV on. Later that night, when Noah had gone to his room to do whatever he did there, I parked in front of the TV to catch the local news. The big story was the body that had washed up. Unlike the guys at the diner, the newscaster displayed suitable respect for human life. The condition of the man's body, as she put it, made identification difficult, but police were treating it as a homicide. She asked the public for assistance. A toll-free number scrolled across the screen. Then she went from murder to town council elections, and I was glad to have the mental image of a decomposing corpse replaced with the perfectly healthy, smiling face of a man I remembered from high school. Henry Carroll was seeking another term. I didn't know how he had time, what with running the yacht charter company he'd inherited from his dad. He'd brought the company back from the brink of ruin, bringing a much-needed influx of tourists and jobs, and the town regularly rewarded him with re-election. It was strange to see a guy I knew from high school on TV. It was strange to be back here and recognize so many people and see they hadn't really changed. If the man whose body had washed up was from around here, I thought, chances are I'd known him too. I hoped not.